Father Lord, we thank you, we exalt and honor you. We thank you for the privilege to stand once again in your presence and to teach your word on this New Year Eve. Father, this is an, a wonderful opportunity to assemble once again in your presence and make your voice heard and run the entire world. Lord, we celebrate a day like this because indeed this is the day you have made. A day we should rejoice. A day we should celebrate. A day we should be glad. A day we should thank you for allowing us to complete the new year. Father, as many that are worried in their hearts because of the body which they felt may follow them into the new year, Father Lord, it is never too late. With you, nothing is impossible. I decree today that that body will be lifted before the new year. That that yoke will be rolled away before the new year. That affliction will not pass this year. Because you said in your word affliction will not rise the second time. Lord, this year affliction will not follow your people into the new year. This year sickness will not cross the dead line to enter into the new year. Lord, the pains of this year will not go into the new year. The sorrow of this year will not go into the new year. Father, I decree this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, I thank you for today's teaching. Open our understanding to know what you are about to teach us. And give us grace to understand what you want us to learn from you. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today, brethren, we have an exciting topic. The topic is Believer Destiny. Believer's Destiny in God. Believer Destiny in God. When we came to God, we believed some certain things about our destiny. So many of us were confused. I have left my boring old life. Now I have returned to Christ. I have given up sin. I have given up the world. I have given up everything that were gained to me, even my knowledge. What have I to gain in this God? What is my destiny in God? Several religions have different conjunctions, like Islam, Buddhism, and other fanatic religions, believes that we are like leaves that fall from a tree in an autumn's from a tree in an autumn into the rivers of life, which take us where it will, depositing us on the bank and sweeping us out into the sea of eternity. This is their belief. That means nobody knows. Wherever destiny takes us, that's where we find ourselves. But that is not what Christianity teaches. Christ creates a sharp contrast to all this religion and in telling us something different from what the world view is that life is unpredictable no in christ life is predictable and life can be reshaped to meet up a destiny that god has planned for you that's why he said in the scriptures i know the thoughts that i think towards you they are thought of good they are not of evil to give you an expected end. God has an end he has planned for you. As a believer, as a faithful person, God has a planned destiny for every child of his. It doesn't matter how many confusion abide in the world. It doesn't matter the state of your economy. It doesn't matter your comfort or your personality. But God has a planned destiny for you. And he said, in sharp contrast, Christ's true faith and prayer, which bring revelation, make us understand something. That we can know God's plans for our life. And that we can find in the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He makes us understand that no man knows the things of God except the Spirit of God that is in him. Just as no man knows the things of man except the Spirit of man that is in him. But if our spirit bear witness with the Spirit of God, we can know the plans of God. That means, contrary to what religions believe, 
is God's plans can be known. God's plan can be revealed. God's plan can be put into perspective. So, how do we know? We have to allow our spirits to bear record with the Spirit of God. It's only when our spirit, no man know the things of God except the Spirit of God. Just as no man know the things of man except the Spirit of man. Spirit know the things of the Spirit. It is only the Spirit of man that can know the things of the Spirit of God. Not the flesh. The physical man can never know the things of God because there are foolishness in his eyes. Never can he even understand it because they are spiritually what? Designed. So, we have to allow our spirit to be a record with the spirit of God so that we can know the things that are freely given us of God. And this plans, now we understand and establish that part that as a believer, the plans of God can be known. And in case you are just following us and you are lost, you don't know where these voices are coming from. My name is Missionary Collins and I will be your teacher in this Open House Fellowship this evening. And if you miss where we are reading from the Bible, we are reading from the book of First Corinthians chapter 1 through the end. All these things I'm saying are there in black and white. I'm not preaching my own words. And I make it clearer to you that if your spirit bear weakness with the Spirit of God, we can know the things that God has handed over to us. God's plans for our life can be known. And if he has a thought that he thinks towards us, they are good one. They are not an evil thought. The thought of God is to bring us a hope and a future. So stop accusing God when you have that little girl, have an accident which you could not control. And you say, why? If God is God, why did he allow this accident? <laughs> and if God, you say God exists, why is he allowing the charge to die? God put you there so that you can change that situation. He thoughts concerning that child are thoughts of good. And let me give you a place that will shock you in the scripture. The Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the saints. Do you know why? Better is the death of the saint than the death of a sinner. Because when a sinner dies, God lost that soul. But when a saint dies, God is happy. Because heaven rejoices. Because a star has been born into the kingdom of God. That means the battle of war is over. He is going to rest. He has finished his labor. And now time of rest has come. And that's why believers do not die. They slept so that they can rest from their labor. And the Bible says their work follow them. And that's why as a believer you should celebrate regardless of whatever comes your way. This is not a time for sadness. It's not a time for weakness. It's a time to celebrate God's plans for our lives. But unless we bring order, bring orderliness into the plans of God for our life. Then the revelation will remain forever a mystery. Because if you don't follow his plans, you will never know about it. It doesn't matter. Yes, the spirits bear witness with the spirit of man. We can know the things of God. But if we do not follow his plan orders, everything will die in a mystery. But the question is, do you want your God-given plans to end up in a mystery. And nothing is known about the vision of God, the plan of God for your life. If that is you, then do things the way you like. Play to the rhythms of life. Blow yourself up so that you can have seven wives in paradise, like some religious belief. But the Lord is saying something to you here. That, behold, your plans, God's plans for your life is knowable. That means, as believers who allow their spirit to bear witness with the spirit of God, we can fathom know God's plan. And the Bible says, who know the mind of God so that he can instruct God and tell him what we need to do. And the Bible makes it clear to us, we, we have the mind of Christ. As believers, 
you have put on Christ. That means the mind of Christ lives in you. And because the mind of Christ lives in you, you can tell God what you want God to do. You can instruct him. You can give him counsel. You can direct him. Abraham shows an example that it is possible for man to give counsel to God. Abraham asked the angel that was sent to Sodom, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? Will the judge of the whole earth do that which is evil? And God looked at him and said, no, God forbid that God should destroy the wicked and the righteous together. Or that the rich wicked should be as the right, that the righteous should be as the wicked. And the Lord said, Abraham said, please, if you find 40 righteous men, will you see destroy the place? He said, no. If I find even 10 righteous men in Sodom, I will spear the whole nation for the sake of 10. That means if God can find 10 good people on earth today, he will spear the whole world for the sake of 10 people. And that is what God is saying. Because God will not destroy the wicked and the righteous in the same world. <laughs> now that we know part of his plan, that his plan can be known by man, that man can give God counsel. What next? We need to fit into his plan. You have to be beloved of God. If you are beloved, we saw it in the case of Daniel and Abraham. If you are beloved of God, God will show you the mystery of things to come. Hidden things of them, of the Lord, are with them that fears the Lord. If you fear him, the hidden secrets comes to you. The knowledge of God is not something you can buy in schools or you can read in textbooks. This knowledge comes spiritually imputed if you fear the Lord and you walk in his footsteps like Daniel did. For better understanding, you can study the book of Daniel. And it makes us clearer that neither we nor this world will benefit from our years in the world. Every man born into the earth is born a star. The day you were given birth to a star has been born. But that star will only become a star if you allow God's plans for your life to materialize. But if you fail to allow God's plans, your star will vanish. It will disappear. Because what happened when the wise men decided out of every place in Judea, the best place to spend the night was Aaron's house. <laughs> the stars of favor left them. And the star disappeared. And that was what will happen to you if you discover that the place of sin is the best place for you to find God. Or academic classroom is the best place for you to find Jesus. You will lose the star. And the stars in your life will only bring darkness. People are given excellent wisdom to manufacture good things, to bring solutions to the crisis of the world. But some of them use this only to invent evil and death for mankind. That is because they lost track with the right star. God has a plan for your life. A successful life depends on God's plans. And this successful life has deep roots in God. You cannot be successful outside God. Somebody will say, hey, hold on a little bit. There are many wicked men on earth that are rich beyond our dream. That has everything. And I want to give you, before you start your argument, the simple answer to your argument is, whenever the wicked rise, some men are hidden. Check the life very well. Somebody's salary is kept by that flood. Somebody's livelihood has been room for him to get to that position. So you cannot see a wicked man rise from labor. But the Bible says, the little that the righteous has is better than the abundance of many wicked. So the wicked does not rise. When the wicked rise, it's because they have stolen from others. When the thieves tell you, I want to make you a I want to make you rich. Believe you me, 
is going to steal from somebody else to give to you. The devil cannot give you what he don't have. He is a thief, a liar, and a master of it. The only thing the devil can give you is debt. And he has nothing good in his hand. When he promises you that he is going to make you rich, he is going to steal from somebody else and give to you. And when you have become rich, he is going to get jealous and steal from you and give to somebody else. And that is how it works. In the circle of the devil, there is no good man. There is no rich man. He has it all. All the cards are in his hand. He plays the way he chooses. There is, it's just like when you say this man is a bad man, very bad man. Yeah, he is bad because the devil made him so. And when they want to kill him, the devil that make him bad will be the first to throw the first stone. Because he has no friends. Every child, man, woman, boy, girl, born of a woman, is an enemy of Satan. If you doubt this, read Genesis. I will put an immunity between you and the woman. Between the serpent and the woman. And between your seed and her seed. They shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his head. The day you were born, you become his enemy. And you did not end that enemy because of your sin or your wickedness. You end it by right. And the day you were born from your mother's womb, you become Satan enemy because your mother is an enemy of the devil. But some people say, but Satan used a lot of women. Yes, he used them as tools for their own destruction. And that is what he does. So stop hating human agents. Hate the devil that used them. The blossom in his glory Finding the right direction. One that brings the most out of your life and changes the lives for better is not dreamed of in a moment, but in combination of eternity. The past, the present, prophetic revelations of his choosing future for you, they are all plans in God. God bettered you. Because he formed you. The everything that makes you alive, he gives to you. No medical research or doctor has been able to find out the reason why you are alive. Because God puts that in there. No mercy can comprehend that. No situation on earth can tell why a man was is alive. Why a man, all the organs in the body are still complete and is dead. The reason is because God is the creator. He is the one that gives you the will to live. Because he is your life. The day you separate from him, you depart. Nobody on earth will say, I don't need God. I'm sorry to say, if you don't need God, you cross over to the other side. Because He is your life. And that's why He told the children of Israel, I have said before you two things. There is only two choices on, on earth, there is no in between life or death, good or evil. There is not like middle ground. You are either good or you are evil. You are either born twice or you are not born at all. There is nothing like neutral. I heard of some groups call themselves whatever name. You cannot be free from God. If you are free from God, you are a tool to the devil. And if you say you are not a tool, just watch your works. You are either for God or you fight against Him. And if you are not fighting against Him and you claim you are not, check your works, not what you say. You are either a tool for good or a force for evil. 
these two does not exist together. You are either a law keeper or you are a law breaker. There is no middle ground. There is no freedom from law. That is exactly how it works also in Christianity. There is no in between between light and darkness. You are either a light or you are darkness. The fact you stay so long in darkness and you begin to think darkness is light does not make it so. A lot of Christians has a great destiny in God. But they realize it too late. Only when they are inside the bus in the grave. That's when they discover, oh, I have such a great talent. God created me to be a wonderful musician. An industrialist. God created me to revelate, to revolutionize the entire human race. But unfortunately, the vision ended up in the grave. Why? Because dream does not bet themselves. Until you find out God parts and walk in it, your dream will remain in obscurity. Your vision will remain in absolute darkness. Until you know God's plan for your life, you have no destiny at all. Some people will say, I have a destiny. No, you don't have destiny outside God. Because you are either for God or you are for the devil. And we know the destiny of the devil. He is a liar, a murderer from the beginning. Whenever he speaks, he speaks of himself. He speaks a lie. The reason why his word, everything that proceeds from his mouth is a lie. Because he speaks of himself. His word cannot be confirmed. Because he is a liar and the father of lies, And does not live in the truth. And because he does not live in the truth, you cannot merge good things out of him. Who will... You will know in eternity past. How? I was not even born then. In the past eternity. But my member were wrought in God. I was part of God. Everything that makes me alive came from him. The Bible said when he took clay, he breathed into it. And man became a living soul. His breath is what makes us alive. Stop saying that God created everything from nothing. Nothing in this world was created from nothing. God created us from himself. Man was just created. And when created was formed, man was still not alive. It's just like today when you build a robot. Robot does not live on its own except you introduce some lighting system or battery. So man cannot live as an eternal generator without a fuel. And what is the fuel that man burns on? The spirit. Without the spirit, man is just an empty case. Just like an idol you made in the shrine. You can carry him, position him like those cos. We call them causes, though they were men once. But the man causes because they are in the mortuary. That is how man is without the spirit of God. You are either with God or you are causes. Before times, you know, there is one lie called truth by Satan. That is the lie he told Eve. You will not surely die. You will die, but not today. So be careful when you hear from Satan. Disobedience to God is not ticket to death. What is telling you you will die because the wages of sin is death? There is no two sanction about it. But not just today. You will die some other time. You were known in eternity past before time began. And there were conversation in heaven about your life. In Jeremiah 1 verse 5, let's read. 
He said, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. That was Genesis, sorry. Let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 Before I formed thee in the belly I knew thee Before thou camest forth out of the womb I sanctified thee I ordained thee a prophet unto the nation I know you from the womb As if you are not clear enough Let's go to Galatians Galatians chapter 1 verse 15 Galatians 1 15 What does he say? Don't bear witness of him No Galatians 1 15 when, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother womb and called me by his grace. When it pleased God who separated me from my mother womb and called me by his grace. What? Let's, if that is not clear enough, let's go to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verse 15 to 16. Please, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and closely wrought in the lowest part of the earth. God knows who you are. There is no secret you can hide from him. Some people will tell you, my secret is my business. Not before God. He knows you better than your name. He knows you better than your parents. Better than the government do. He knows who you are. Even before you were formed. Even before bones came together in your mother's wombs. Before you even became human. He knows who you are. He knows you from your liquid states. He puts you there. He grows you. He fed you. The Spirit held all things together. You were not formed without the Spirit. Your direction, your hymns did not medically germinate. It was the Spirit of God that coordinates the factors that put you together. And assembled you and ordained you to be a star for the world. The sovereign God chose you before the world began. What? Then why did I not start functioning when I was a child? He chose you before you were born. He waited for you to be mature. The Bible says, a child as long as it's a child. Is not different from a servant. Though he be the master of the house. Though he be the leaders of everything. But is kept under tutors and counsel. Until the time appointed of the father. Though he is the owner of the house. Though he is the sovereign of the house. Though he is the keeper of the gate of the house. But he is not different from ordinary servants. As long as he's a child. Until when he grows into a man, when the time has come that the father appointed to deliver all things into the hands of the son, the sovereign Lord chose you. So he knew the time of your birth. He knew the time of your maturity. He knew when best to hand you an assignment. Your birth date and place, your color, your appearance, your parents, your background, whether rich or poor. So you can assume 
that he has a plan for the rest of your life too. What? Your past prepared you for something. Yes. Some people will say, what about my past? If God was aware of all this, why did he allow me to wallow in sin? Why did he allow me to serve under the satanic bondage? Sin bets. The wounded hands of Jesus has been uniquely prepared. Preparing you. Why? He wants you to go through what you went through. All these are his plans. To give you an expected end. He doesn't want you to be a robot. To be constructed without reason. Man gave himself the ocean of choice by eating the forbidden fruits. That means God can do everything for us, but God cannot decide for us. Man has that unique ability. The choice to live and to die is in our hands. All God can do is to persuade us to choose life so that we and our generation might live. But if we decide to die, he cannot stop us. That is our choice. And that is why God is respected. If you have been in any occultic gathering, you will understand that the devil does not look, leave room for choice. If you are in any secret court, there is nothing like choice. Don't go to the devil temple and say, I have rights. Your right will end in the grave and inside the left, inside a cubic bush that's where your right will end because he doesn't believe in right choice does not exist with satan none of his agents believe in choice they believe you don't have the human moral right to be able to choose for yourself so are their ruling agents in the world they don't believe any man has democratic rights to choose to do good or evil no you are not good enough to choose. That's why many autocrats decide for their people. They help them to decide what is good and evil because they are not wise enough to decide. But the Lord make us understand He is the God that believes in democracy. A God who gave us the right to choose. He said before us life and death. And He gave us the right choice. Choose life so that you and your generation might live. And he said to the children of Israel, I put life on Mount Hammer and death on Mount Heber. But I can say you are your generation, that you, man, your children may live and see the goodness of the land. Choose light. Choose life on Mount Hammer so that you and your generation might live. But some of them refused. They chose death and they died. Since death wounded the hands of the Lord, he has been uniquely preparing you for such a day for you to be wise enough to choose what is good. And the word of the Lord says, eat that which is sweet and drink that which is good. The Lord has uniquely prepared you to live the bitterness of life and to choose sweetness with God. And that's why Jesus himself said, come unto me, all you who are tired of laboring in the world. And a heavenly laden, I will give you rest. There is rest uniquely in Christ. And his rest has no sorrow attached to it at all. Shaped by the master potter. The Lord is the potter and you are the crib. I know how much many people hate to be called the crib. And that is whom you are, I'm sorry to say. Man in all his goodness and all his beauty was raised from the dust. Dust and ashes we are. And when we die, we shall return back to dust. So no man can save his life from death. I'm sorry to say. Even if we wake you up from the death, you will still die again. If we heal your sick, you will still get sick again. True, good, and bitter experience alike in the families and in the circumstances, schools, religious teachings, whether Christians or not, can you see the fingerprints of Jesus on your past, giving you a lifetime of grace, 
protection from accident, evils in schools, in the schools of life, you have lived when other have not. You have been coming on the road. Somebody that is ahead of you just want to cross the road and the car took the person and he died. And you are alive. Do you think it is because you were not holy enough? What of the other case? You were in the front. You just crossed the road. Did somebody on your back intending to do the same? And it was hit down by a car and died. Is it because you were too fast? Or the person was not smart enough? You were in robbery for 15 years and the Lord saved you. Other people were in robbery for two years and they faced firing squad. Is it because you were wiser than they are? Or you were too smart for God to save your life? No. God prepared you. The grace of God allows you to come to repentance. He wants to see you. That man may have had his chance. Now is your chance because you don't know what days will break tomorrow. Then life really began. God honey more time. <laughs> God look at infants and then he saw them grow. Oh, they make a lot of mistakes. And those mistakes, he allowed them. And he corrects them gradually until they are matured enough to make decisions of life. He brought you into a place of sensing the holiness, the feeling, convict you of your sin, facing a lost eternity. His Spirit reveals your Savior to you. Jesus gave you faith to believe and to become the follower of God's Son. And the new believers often seem to enjoy a honeymoon period. And that is the period where God tells you, no matter how many your sins are, I have forgiven them all. <laughs> no matter how good care you were before, I have erased it all. No matter how terrible your life is, I will give you milk and honey. God is with you. Whenever you turn, your honeymoon is like never ending. <laughs> before you ask, he answered. While the word is yet in your mouth, he bring it to pass. He healed your sickness. Save your affliction. You say, wow, this God is so sweet. This God is so good. And even the righteous get jealous. And they say, look, I have been in the service of the Lord for 100 years. God has not given me a calf to make merry with my friend. <laughs> but this man has went and squandered all that God has. And he come back to the fold. And God is giving him every good thing. That was what happened between the prodigal sons and his elder brother. The other brother was furious. And he said, all these years I have been in the service of my father. And my father has never even given me a calf to feast with my friend. Now this way was son come back. After going to squander all that the father has. And has come back and the father killed the father's ram to make merry for him. <laughs> the father looked at him and said, my son, let us rejoice. This your brother was lost. But now he's found. <laughs> he was missing, but now he has come back home. That's why heaven rejoiced. That's why Jesus said, Which of us have a hundred sheep? And one of them goes astray and does not leave the ninety-nine in the open feet. And run and seek for one that is missing. And the Bible said, if he find it, he will rejoice. He will souls will be merry. He will call his friends and they will feast together because of one that's was formed. Yet is healings and freedom from satanic griefs of the past. Grace, trees of baptisms in waters, the feeling of the Holy Spirit, all this symbolizes God's joy and rejoicing over your life. In Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 10. I think we have to read Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 10. Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 10. He said, And you had he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin, 
Where he in time past, he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now walks in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation in time past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling of the desire of the flesh and of the mind, and we are by nature the children of wrath. Are even as other are. But God, when who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together in Christ. By grace am I saved. That is not of myself, it is the gift of God. And hath raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the age to come, he might shew the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith. That is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of work, lest any man living should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good work which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Brethren, this is a wonderful trail. A lesson I wish I can keep teaching forever. The call of God. The call of the presence. God is calling you at this present time. It is not long before we find out that God has planned for us. Our curiosity is rose. See Jeremiah 29 verse 11. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. What did God say in Jeremiah? Twenty-nine verse eleven. He said to us. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thought of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. God knows the thoughts that he thinks towards you. What are these thoughts? Thought of peace. They are not evil thoughts, but to give you an expected end. What are we here for them? In John 3, verse 13, verse 3. He make us understand. We learn like Jesus. We have come from God. And we yet for God. And one day we shall return unto God. It doesn't matter how we live. But we must all return to the one with whom we have to do. Knowing these thoughts in our heart, what manner of man are we supposed to be? Knowing this brought Jesus such security that he and the creators of the world and God of all was able to save even washing the feet of his disciples because he knew he came from God and he was returning back to God and to prepare the disciple with humility that nothing they have that they did not receive and if you did receive them, you should not boast yourself as if those things were naturally yours. There is nothing you have on earth that you have by right. <laughs> they came from God and they will return to God. Even your spirit came from God and will one day return to God. Pray to discover God's plan. That's what every believer should try to do. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, that God has prepared good work in advance for us to do. So find out from the Lord why you were ever born and then born again. And grasp his eternal purpose and the job that Jesus had for you to do. In John 15 verse 16, figure out what job God has for you. Now, that you, let's read John 15, 16. 
Then after that, we move to the next level. John 15, 16. John 15, 16 said, Ye have not chosen me. I did not choose God. In fact, if you ask me when I was a child what I hate more than any other thing is to become a preacher. But I find myself in one. Because you never chose God, God chose you. I have chosen you, says the Lord, and obey you that you should go forth and bring forth fruits, and that your fruits should remain. God did not send us to bring forth leaves. God sent us to bring forth fruits. And those fruits should remain. Our message, our teaching, our purpose should be aimed at bringing forth fruits. And those fruits, we have to endeavor to ensure they are sustained. If the fruits are not sustained, our work in the Lord is vain. God has sent me to tell you that his job for you is to bring forth fruits. And your fruits should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Whatsoever. Not some things. Not some few things or some selected things that they ask the Father or only to pray for headache. Only to pray for legs. Only to pray for eyes. Only to cast out devils. No. Whatsoever things. Whatsoever. How many? Whatsoever. Quantity? Whatsoever. Decision? Whatsoever. I shall ask in the name of Christ. As long as I key into his purpose and his calling for my life. It will be done. And this has been the lifeline of my ministry. Because whatsoever I ask God, it is done. So God wants you to do whatsoever. Whatever situation people bring to you, it is because they knew that God can do whatsoever. Stop whining and stop thinking as if you are the one that will fix whatsoever. God is the one that is fixing whatsoever. So let whatsoever be put in the hand of God. Whosoever can do whatsoever. It doesn't matter what your name is. But as long as you follow God's vision for your life, you will be able to do whatsoever. Now, come to my most lovable parts of this teaching. Write the vision. What must I write my vision down? I thought vision is just for me to see. I see people pocket. I see how many wives they marry. I see that their children is sick at home. And I see that they are able to stand up. Is that not what vision is for? No. God wants us to write down the vision. And the vision of God has a specific purpose. It has a goal. When God called me, He said to me, Find out my people that are at. And my answer then was, How can I find them out? But today I know how. But then I didn't know how. But if I have not written the vision, I will never know how to find them out. But God expects you to write the vision down on the paper. In Exodus chapter 31 verse 18. First Chronicle chapter 28 verse 19. But we are going to read Revelation 1 19. Revelation 1 19. What did he say? He said, write 
the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be here after. The purpose of God's vision are for you to write the things you have already seen with God. To write the things of today and to write the things that have not yet been fulfilled. That is the reason why God wants you to write your vision in a paper. So that when it comes to pass, you will know that he said it. As a minister, take time to write the vision you have seen on a paper. The vision of today, write it also. And what is going to happen tomorrow that God has revealed to you, that has not been made public, you also write it down. So when it comes to pass, you can point to it and say, I write it here. God expects Christians to write their vision. Now, plant the vision. You see the purpose? Why you have to write the threefold vision? The purpose is for you to plant the, view, the vision for your future. Because if you don't know the vision of your yesterday, you will not know how to handle your today. If you don't know the vision of your today, you will not know how to handle the future. So that's why you need to write the three vision. The vision of your yesterday, the vision of your today, and the vision of your tomorrow. And so when you know all of them, you put it together, you're able to construct an indestructible house. As a seed in prayer, letting it rest in God, waiting the day when the new life and harvest will come. John 12 verse 24. You have to plant this seed. When the seed is planted, what next? Set a clear goal to shape your future. Effective goals are smart. That is to say, clear goal. Streamline your thoughts, prayer, diaries, resource. They release power like nothing else can. Solid and tangible. That is not vague, not vague vision. Streamline your vision. Make it define a specific purpose. Put it down according to a decree. Measure the vision. Like Ezekiah was given a measure of read. He was told to measure the temple. Measure the time. And break your vision into little, little projects according to the times in your hands. To see how you are doing. And use this clock of direction to measure what you are today and where you will be tomorrow and what you will be next tomorrow. Achievable, realistic, not impossible goal. Put your vision within those brackets. Reputable, clear enough to tell others. Make your vision so plain. That's what the Bible said to the prophet Habakkuk. Write the vision. Make it plain. Put it on top of a tablet that it may run for many days. Write your vision down. Print it into books. Make it clear to your disciple. So that when any disciple that sees it can run with it. They don't need to wait for you. Most vision we write are not for us. Some of them will not be alive when they are implemented. When God gave you a vision, he wanted to write it down for the generation following. And so today we have Bible. Bible is called the book of book for a reason. Because there are summation of different people's vision being put together in a book called Books of Books. And that's what we call the Bible. And that's why when we read, we can run with it. So you can also put your vision down so that when your fellow are read it, they will understand it. It will be clear to them. They will run with the vision. Plant with deadline to finish each task. Make your vision pertain to a particular deadline. You have a church building, this is the time. You have a church investment, this is the set time. You have mission objective, this is the set time. You have goals and visions, this is the set time. 
Don't set arbitrary a vision or achievement which can never be entertained. Make your goals limited. You have a short-term goal, let's say at least for the next three months. This is a good one. Three, three months in a year. Three months for training. Three months for outreach. Three months for training. Three months for outreach. Three months for training. Three months for outreach. By so doing, your mission will be well shaped and the plan focus and you'll be able to achieve a desired results. Say in the next two years, the long term, 10 years from now, this is where I want to be. Three years, this is where we are now. Two years, this is what we are now. This is what we must do this year. And let's finish it. Next year, this is what we must do. Let's finish it. And by so doing, you have a clear set of goal. And that is how you plan for the future that God has shown you. If not, your future will remain mystery. And you'll keep dreaming about it. That's why we have millions of pastors who dream and see large congregation. They never achieve it until they die. Priority adds even more power. The fact they don't achieve those visions until they die. Does it make God a liar? No, God is true. But that man is a liar. Because he refused to follow the plan to actualize his vision. And that's why the Bible says, let every man be a liar and let God be true. Priority adds even more power to you. No one can walk on more than six goals at the same time. <laughs> there are things we must do as believers. Well, before we continue, I just want to apologize because today we're going to take extraordinary time. Because for your own purpose, this lesson will be longer than our specified one hour time. Because we want you to have this documented in your file. So you can review it whenever it comes to needs. Priorities add even more powers to you as a believer. No one can walk on more than six goals at the same time. You have to set a list of targets. Streamline your goals. Don't make everything too bulky. Reduce the targeted list so that you will be able to achieve. You want to be personally responsible for not only the church, for yourself, for your family, and for your Christian service. These three must work together for you to have a balanced ministry. If you don't do the three, you will become a failed minister. And that's why as a Christian, you have to balance your time. Then, like a mission, we set target of goal for mission every year for at least the first nine months of the year. Then after that, the last three months, which is from October, November, December. We leave it for planning, focus, repurpose, and planning for the next year. Through this period, we use it to train our converts, to empower our ministers, and to repurpose and train converts. That's what we do in CGF. Because planning for the entire years, you end up not spending six months out of the year to achieve those goals. Then, ask yourself the vision. Ask yourself one simple question. What is your division? If God allow me six things before I die, what are six most important things I would like to do? Which is six? Which six will they be? And of those, which is the most important of the six that you want to achieve first? And then the second, etc. So, the most important one you know you want to achieve first, that all your ministry hang on that, go for that, go first. Leave the rest. It will not run away. With time, you will get there.
Good answer. Make perfect plans. Why would I need a good answer to make a perfect plan? To make a perfect plan for even a small church local project, ask seven questions. The answer will give you a perfect plan. What do I want to do exactly? Why do I want to do this? When will I do it? Exactly. When shall I begin? Or what is my aim day of finishing the task? Who will supervise me? Work with me? Who will benefit from my plans? How will I do it? Step one. Step two, etc. How much will it cost? Luke chapter 14, verse 28 to 29. If any one of us wants to build a tower, he must first sit down and count the cost. So that when he starts, he is able to finish. Let people mock him. Say, this man started building a tower. He starts now, he is not able to finish. Now put your plan into action. Because faith without work is death. So, your faith is zero if you does not put it to work. Oh, God showed me I'm going to open a refinery in Nigeria. Good news. Where is the refinery 30 years ago? Now, God showed you 30 years ago. Today is to enough 68 years. This is the last. Where is the refinery? Why is it not there? Because you were not able to put it to action. Because your faith was dead, because your vision dies the day you refuse to give birth to it. As believers, we deliver our vision. Delivering your vision does not mean you must build a castle in the night. If you want one stone upon another, the Bible says, preset upon preset. Lay your foundation one stone at a time. And a little child went to the river with his father. And his father breaks some pieces of bread and begins to spread it in the river. The child said, this river is so big and the fishes are so many. What difference does this your little bread make? The father said, pick up another piece of bread and throw it into the river and say, this makes all the difference. Little by little, you will change the entire course of nature. You will bring your vision to reality. And your plans in God will be seen by all. Spiritual plans are better in a spiritual house. But until men see it, they cannot have faith in what they don't see. You can't keep crying to your member for 60 years. Believe! 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 But unfortunately, how can they believe him when they are not seeing anything? Oh, we want this church to be a miracle church. Praise the Lord. But a set one problem about No miracle is taking place. I want this church to be a deliverance church. But no deliverance is taking place. Oh, it just be like the insurrection in the Roman Catholic Church. We want to convert, com, we want to convert water to the body and the, of Christ. This miracle and people tasted the wine and said, "Well, sir, this is water. I have done the miracle of transubstantiation, converting water or wine to the body and blood of Christ." Unfortunately, it's not. Is that what you want to become? Your miracle has to be given a meaning by saying. And for you to bring your miracle to life, you have to follow the plans. Take your Bible. Read what Jesus did. In the daytime, he was with his disciples. They fellowship together. They preached the gospel. In the night, he was on the mountain. Crying to God. Asking God to come down. And manifest his power the next day. And the Lord indeed came down the next day and manifest his power. What did he do? 
He went before he started his ministry into the wilderness. Fasted and cried up to God to discipline the flesh and to put to death and in the flesh. So that was why Christ's ministry was not filled with scandal like you have today. When he destroyed the flesh, the spirit came alive. He allowed time for the tempter to tempt him. He escaped temptation just like you and I. Good. So that he can boldly say, The God of this world comments, he has nothing in me. He prepared for his ministry. He went through the baptism of John. Though he has no need of it, no sin was recorded against him. He went through Holy Ghost baptism. But the dove, the spirit came upon him in form of a dove. Just like you and I. To prepare him for the work of the ministry. Stop saying, I have the call. I don't need anybody to teach me. Who told you? Yes, it is true that the anointing you receive is your teacher. But you still need the school of life. If not, you will grieve the spirits before three weeks. We prepare to commit our time, energy, prayer, money, reputation, pride, knowing that all hard works brings a profit. Romans 14, verse 23. The Bible says, He that gathered by labor is wise. So, with that labor, you cannot benefit. You cannot survive in ministry if you don't commit time, energy to it. If you don't commit yourself to it, we tried it many times and it fails woefully. Even for a striving ministry, we died a natural death. Because we cannot commit time to it. We said, let's just leave the people to run it. The people don't have the vision. The people don't have the call. It is only the man that has the call that will be a good shepherd to the sheep. That when he see the wolf coming, he doesn't run away. We took somebody to mission and that man never recovered. Till tomorrow, if you measure mission, he doesn't want to run, go to the mission. He's running away from the mission field. Because of the affliction he faced them. Because he's a hired. He was not a shepherd. The hiring will flee because he's hired. He is not a shepherd. He cares not in about the sheep. But the good shepherd will lay down his life for his sheep. It is only a shepherd when he see a gunman coming and they want to shoot any of his missionaries who say, kill me first, I am the leader. But a hire will be the first to run because he's hired. He cared nothing about the sheep but about his salary. You cannot put your ministry in the hand of a hire <laughs> because the hire will free because he's hired. He is not the shepherd. Don't forget to take lots of advice and learn from other ministers. Every three months, every year, and evaluate the progress and make necessary changes. Don't be a amorphous minister. This is the way we always do it. No. The way we always do it lead to the grave. The Pharisees were used to the way we always do it. What did they do? They planned the death of Christ. The way we always do it, you begin to fight each other rather than doing the work God sent you. Don't follow the traditional method. Because the Orthodox religions will tell you this is, it has never been so seen. This is the way we plan it. This is the way it must be. But Christians who live by faith will say, God dictates and I follow. Christians should allow God to be their soul director. Break down every house that does not stand well and remove the block and repair the foundation, rebuild it. There is nothing wrong with scattering the foundation and restarting afresh if the foundation is not balanced. 
It is better to start afresh than to lead thousands to hell. Restarting is not the same. Most times in the mission, we have broke down the wall many times and rebuilt the gate. Even till tomorrow, if we find faults in the foundation, we still break down the foundation and restart again. Because it helps us to remain strong and to build a perfect foundation that God Himself will be pleasing. Always realize the vision is not the member. Stop trying to please the member so they don't go away. The vision is you. If no member come, write the vision. Preach to the empty bench. God will bring people that will listen. It is not for you to advertise yourself. God is the one that announced you before the people. He will bring people to listen to his word. But then, this is where we are going to end today's teaching. And I want you to understand this great teaching. Believer destiny in God can be known. We can plan for it. We can prepare to, for it and we can achieve it. Pedro, I'm going to pray for you today. If you are a minister out there, oh, you are a brother, God has shown you your destiny, but you don't know how to get there. Come to our fellowship. Write to us. We will give you guidelines, put you in a training, and before some time, we discover you are already on your path to your destiny. And God will help you to achieve that desired destiny today. Christians have plans. And that plans come solely from Christ. Christ is the true foundation of the church. No one can come to God except God be with him. Brethren, today you have a choice. Do you want to walk in God's plan? Or you want to lose God's plan to yourself? You want to focus on a trivial earthly desire that will vanish away with time? Or you want to walk with God? The Bible said, Enoch could walk with God. He was not sin because God took him. Do you want to walk with God? Or you want to be like Daniel? The Bible said, the angel said to Daniel, a man greatly beloved. He rose in till president. Something that has never been heard in history. A nation was conquered. A man that was supposed to be a slave became the governor. And from there he became the center of command. Even the king desired to set him above all the presidents. He take God's grace. And for you to reach that level, you need to discipline yourself. And you must be there to work with God. There is no one that works with God that fails. Nation will fail. Politicians can only elevate you in his tenor. The government can only favor you in their states. But God will favor you around the world. So if you work with God, you will not fail. Let us pray. Lord, I raise my hands up to you because you are my life. Because my life depends on you. My life does not depend on the states. My life does not depend on the government or the people. My life depends on you. My destiny is funded in Christ. Because you are the one that caught me. Lord, these ones that have agreed with me and lifted up their hands like this. Lord, you will touch those hands. You will direct their path to fulfill their God-given destiny. As you have helped me, help them likewise. Let their destiny be accomplished in God. And let their visions become a reality. Lord, guide them with understanding. Teach them with divine grace until they stand tall in the ministry that God has given them. For in Jesus' mighty name we will pray. Amen. God bless you. And we are happy to welcome you to our fellowship. Just read the line under the video. Join our question and answer session every Saturday where you have opportunity to bring your question. If the video is unclear, don't worry. Just test us your questions. We will answer them with you through a video teaching. And God bless you as you participate. 
and every teaching you miss you can once you are in our site don't worry once you are in our our whatsapp link you will always have the pre, the f set of the video in an audio file sent to you after the teaching god bless you and we are waiting for your participation and we'll be happy that you join us this saturday so that all your questions will be answered because this teaching on saturday we are going to allow people to ask questions from it so that they will have more insight on how to build their spiritual life god bless you as you participate amen we'll see you again wednesday by 9 a.m